I'm Nicole Seeley, Programs Director here at Kaveh Khanum Foundation. As you may already know, Kaveh Khanum is a national organization dedicated to cultivating the artistic and professional growth of black poets. This evening, we're honored to present one-time classmates and longtime friends, Tina Chang and Tracy K. Smith, who have generously donated tonight's talk, the spirit that has charged a conversation about poetry and friendship. A few housekeeping items before we, be, before we begin. After the Q&A, we'll have a drawing. Uh, six lucky attendees will receive this little book, Friendship Poems. Can you pull that up, please? Fitting for tonight's talk. Uh, Marwa Halal, Kaveh Khanum's fabulous grants manager, will pass around baskets to collect half of your tickets. So keep those tickets. I so wanted to prepare intros worthy of these two giants. That, however, is an impossible task, as there is no introduction that would do either justice. So instead, I'll just read their bios. Tina Chang, Brooklyn Poet Laureate, is the author of the poetry collections Half-Lit Houses and of Gods and Strangers. Her poems have been published in journals such as American Poet, McSweeney's, The New York Times, and Plowshares. She has received awards from the Academy of American Poets, the New York Foundation for the Arts, and Poets and Writers, among others. She teaches poetry at Sarah Lawrence College, and she is also a member of the International Writing Faculty at the City University of Hong Kong. Tracy K. Smith is the author of the critically acclaimed memoir, Ordinary Life, and three books of poetry. Her collection, Life on Mars, won the 2012 Pulitzer Prize. Dwayne Day won the 2006 James Laughlin Award from the Academy of American Poets and an Essence Literary Award. The Body's Question was the winner of the 2002 Kaveh Khanna Poetry Prize. Smith was the recipient of a Rona Jaffe Writer's Award and a Whiting Award. She is the director of Princeton University's Creative Writing Program. Please help me welcome Tina Chang and Tracy K. Smith. and our talk, and um, I just wanted to tell, this is going to be completely off the cuff. I love Tracy so much. I wanted to first say thank you, Nicole, for such a sweet introduction, and uh, thank you to Kaveh Kano. I feel, I was just telling my husband, I feel so blessed to have been welcomed in by Kaveh Kano. We've had an opportunity to do several uh, events together, and then Tracy and I started a collaboration between Kaveh Khanna and the Asian American Writers Workshops, I think for about five years in a row, so I feel so grateful to this organization. Um, I'm also very honored to speak to my best friend in the whole world, who is Tracy K. Smith. Um, just to give you a little bit of history, we met each other uh, almost 20 years ago, or over 20 years ago? Over, 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 over 20 years ago. <laughs> over 20 years ago. We met each other at Columbia University, where we entered in as very nervous students. Uh, we didn't know exactly what we were doing, but we knew that we loved poetry very much, and we entered in with very high hopes as to what our lives would look like later, but we didn't know exactly how that would materialize or what that would mean or come to be. Um, but we had really wonderful guides along the way. We studied with Lucille Clifton and Mark Doty and Lucy Brock Broyo, Alfred Korn, Richard Howard. So we had really good people along the way to guide us. Um, I think the way I wanted to start, and I told Tracy, I'm just going to read two letters because it's really have, has been a life in letters, among other things. You know, we um, exchanged letters throughout the past 20 years, even if we're living in the same neighborhood. I mean, oftentimes we're living pretty much right next door to each other, but still felt the need that, um, in whatever the, it was that we were going through, we were always exchanging letters about our process, about craft, about life. So it really was a very multi-layered life. We also um, took lots of photographs of each other. We went through um, and sang a lot of karaoke songs together. So it, 
which we will not do. Oh, this would be a perfect opportunity because I thought this mic might serve a really wonderful purpose. Um, so just to let you know how we started out, and um, I told Tracy, I, she knows, I keep everything. I, I keep my... I keep my um, research papers and my papers from when I was probably five or six years old. So I've kept, and I'll be a great archivist for Tracy because I've kept everything she has ever written. So this says, um, this is from Tracy in, in May 2000. Um, and so this was 16 years ago and we just graduated from Columbia and we both moved out to California. Tracy was studying, um, she's getting her Stegner and I moved out to California at the same time because I had a, a love out there, so we wound up being in the same place. And she says, um, Dear Tina, I'm having a hell of a time trying to find a job that makes sense. What do the prospects look like for you? I could use a pep talk, maybe a visit to Dodge Hall, that's Columbia. Some of our fame antics, fame was our favorite film back then. Is any of that still there? In the meantime, I'm trying to revisit my poems with the idea in mind of putting together a manuscript again. After the thesis process, I just wanted to start over. Now I realize that, though I haven't written as much as I should have, I've written more than I thought, and that if I can simply revise and finish, I will have the new body of work I've wanted. So that's what I'm doing, poem by poem. It's strange because I've always balked at sitting down to work on old material, but once I do, it always draws me in and excites me. That's what I'm feeling now. So it kind of starts off in this place of real questioning. We, we all have been through this place of like, what kind of job am I gonna get? What am I gonna do with my life? And then just a quick two years later, in this short letter, this is on September 5th, 2002, she says, Tina, I can't wait to see you tonight so we can acknowledge face to face the remarkable journey we started together seven years ago has lately started to get really interesting. You don't know, or maybe you do, how excited I am that we'll be shepherding our manuscripts through the same process at the same time these next many months. It's like those friends who end up having babies at the same time. We did, by the way. We had our babies, we had our babies at the same time. <laughs> We are pregnant at the same time and the babies at the same time. Do you have this strange, giddy feeling from time to time when you remember that the book is going to materialize? I'm overtaken by extreme bliss. Could it be that our lives as writers are beginning? So I love, I love this letter so much from Tracy because um, it reminds us that we all come up from a place of sincere questioning. We really, truly didn't know what we were doing, and we were always seeming like we were feeling in the dark, but we always very much had each other. And I guess um, the first question that I have for Tracy, because also we like to play a lot of games, and uh, we sort of broke it down into a lot of questions and different categories, but one of the questions I wa wanted to ask Tracy is, um, so in our youth, we were so filled with so much self-doubt, I think, in the beginning, when I read back on all of our letters, and. Can you think of anything useful that came out of these phases of doubting ourselves? Because every writer and every artist goes through this. Oh God, um, thanks for giving me the chance to hear our younger self, my younger self, and imagine you as the listener there. Um, I have been thinking about that feeling of doubt in a way that is a little counterintuitive. I just went to Columbia's commencement yesterday I didn't even go to our commencement because of, I don't know, the schedule when we were graduating. And so that was the first time I sat through that event and the beautiful campus, there are thousands of blue robes and family members. And I just felt myself so emotional. And I also realized that the feeling you have when you're finishing you know, the institutional part of becoming a writer, which is full of guidance, mentorship, peers who are going through the same thing. When that ends, I at least felt this tremendous sense of possibility, like the whole world was there and anything could happen, and also impossibility, like how in the world was I gonna be able to do this huge thing? And what I think now, having just taken that step and found a way to keep going, is that 
I'm always trying to get back to that feeling. I'm always trying to say, how can I shake myself free of what I've just done or what I think I know how to do and get to that place where things are real or something matters again and where I'm scared um, and where everything, um, everything's riding on the first step and then the next step that I take. I think artists are constantly trying to reinvent that feeling of, of beginning. Um, so I, mean, I feel so grateful to that time. Did I answer your question? Yeah? Um, I want to ask you something. Well, you know, we have a multi-pronged approach to tonight's <laughs> format. <clears throat> and one is um, we have these categories that seem to relate to us as people. And we've each devised a question for each category. So the categories are spirituality, geography, music, history, and love. What category do you want to be asked about? I know it's about music. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. Music is fun. In, my mo in most of my memories of the two of us before we were full-fledged grown-ups, which I only think happened about three years ago, um, we're either dancing or singing. I think of wandering into buildings on West 32nd Street climbing up a few flights of unmarked stairs and then finding ourselves in a karaoke den several nights a week. <clears throat> I think of singing Killing Me Softly <clears throat> over half price sushi <laughs> and staring back in confused disbelief at a young man who com complimented our performance. <laughs> I think of dancing with you to the theme song of fame in the halls of Dodge Hall when we were students in Columbia. I think of Prince and David Bowie. God bless them. They're here probably everywhere, even larger than they were in life, as the soundtracks to so many of our nights together as young women. And I think of this song. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have a song. Um, and I just, I thought it might be a fun thing to do if, if technology um, is gonna <clears throat> cooperate to just listen and um, free associate a little bit. conversation that we're not going to touch upon, but like, when you get older, all the things that were so easy become so hard somehow. Maybe I'll just do it all over again through the internet, uh, even though I like bought the song and everything. I'm sorry, guys. Tracy had mentioned that, um, so there was a long phase that I think lasted from the year 2000 to the year 2008 in which I was just telling her that it was just our most searching and messed up phase where we kind of did everything that we wanted to do and karaoke was a tremendous part of our lives. And we loved karaoke so much that we even purchased a karaoke machine together so that we could install it in her home and sing to each other, although both of us sang pretty off-key. And um, I wrote down some of our favorite songs at that time, which was Elton John's Tiny Dancer, Paul Simon's You Can Call Me Al, <laughs> The Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody, and of course, David Bowie's Space Oddity. And we were so obsessed with the machine that we sang on it every few days. And then, we'd, and then we also invited people over until they started getting very tired of us. And then we decided that we had to give the machine away. We had to give it a break. So we wound up giving it to like an old, well, not, he's my present husband. So we had to give it to him to place in his bar. And so 
I guess I wanted to know, what do you think that period or that machine like meant? Like, why were we so invested or interested in that machine at that point? <laughs> I think a lot about that time, and I also think about, um, I feel so lucky that I met you, because you are somebody who is so willing to just throw your whole self into something, and I think that what we had found to throw ourselves into was this wish to not just write poems, but to make meaning or to find some sort of, of, of um, purpose in, in through language. And um, I also feel like that sense that we were surrendering to um, a craft led us through these different versions of ourselves. You know, when we were at Columbia, I, I personally loved the idea of being an art school, <laughs> even though the writing program is the least, you know, like exotic one. But you feel like, oh, we're art students, and I need to throw off all of my inhibitions and, and dive into experience in ways like make art. And I feel like we, we left um, school with that kind of residual feeling. Like I need to get past a sense of control and decorum and see if I can tap into something that feel, feels more um, alive and um, that, that leads me to a place where surprises can happen, you know? Um, we were talking about this on the way over here, but it's really exciting to believe that something that has to do with our beings is at stake in the creative process. It's not just about making good work that could be published, you know? I feel that we share this belief that what we're trying to do is like fix our souls or, or do something that's gonna make um, a difference even even after we're, we're gone, not for other people, but for ourselves. Does that make sense to you? Like the sense of evolving, or um, I don't know, like it as I hate the word aspirational, but I feel like it's a way that our, our being can aspire to grow. Does that, does that sound familiar to you? I've been thinking about prints a lot. Um, so when I think of Tracy, I think about David Bowie a great deal because so much of our, it seems like our childhood, I want to say our childhood, uh, was fixed in that moment where she was invested so much in Bowie and Bowie shows up a lot in her, in her book of poetry as well, in Life on Mars. And I've been thinking about Prince and the impact that somebody could make. I don't know, I, I was so, um, I was so transfixed and also, um, deeply, deeply um, in mourning about his death, I was actually very uh, surprised that people on Facebook were going back to the same sort of posts after his death because I was, I was deeply, deeply mourning him and still, still am at this very moment, I think. But I think in, in connecting with each other in terms of music, I think allowed us to have so many more deeper conversations about what it is that we wanted to do as artists, and um, it also allowed for us to have a certain kind of letting go, which was really important for us at that period of time from the year 2000 to the year 2008. We needed to let go, because we were just discussing this on the way here, that um, I think that Tracy and I had always been very good girls, you know, throughout our entire lives. We were very straight and narrow, very much of the mind that we wanted to do well, and we wanted to do well by others that by the time we sort of got to this phase in life, we needed sort of a turning off point to be able to find that sort of more rebellious side of ourselves, which felt important to like the creative forces at work too, don't you think? Oh yeah, I mean, even in like specific terms, I feel like when I first started writing poetry and even while we were um, doing our MFAs, I had this idea that poems were based on uh, knowledge and wisdom, that the poet was imparting, naming and imparting line by line in the poem, and I didn't have that. I had the huge desire to write poems. I had one or two ideas that felt like they could be um, written with a sense of authority, but I could never get past that. And then I realized that what I loved was when a poem would enact some kind of search. And the poet had questions that couldn't get answered, but that generated a kind of pondering that felt like something I could participate in. 
I think that for us, and maybe for everybody, that pondering kind of made its way off the page into unlikely choices and possibilities in the real time, you know, at 5 p.m. Yeah. Um, let me see if my song will come up, and if not, we'll, we'll skip it. Um, that show was it like in the 70s was that show and um, it was the first time where I felt like a, a similarity between myself and another family you know all the other families that I felt like I was seeing on television I felt so dissimilar to them you know even all in the family there were other aspects of that and I felt like okay I could see myself in a sort of like middle class family with strife and but that was the first time where I felt like oh I can see myself in the place of this family, in the same sort of similar struggles that we had, um, just trying to get food on the table. But in terms of that particular time in our life, well, it's also we had the song Sanford and Son, the, the theme song to Sanford and Son, you know that one, the Sanford and Son song? But, but um, yeah, I mean, I felt like that particular time in our lives was such a great marker of, of all the possibilities that lay before us. But also when I think back on that time, I think, there were good times, and then it was also really balanced by tremendous, I think, times of, of deep, deep questioning, too. Like, when I go back on some of the sort of intimate letters that we had with each other, there were times where we really just didn't know what was happening with our writer's life and with our love lives and all of it seemed to sort of be mixed together. So I, when I hear that song, I'm like, oh, it's really like good times that we were going through and then also like this like low, very, very difficult times of saying, you know, where are we headed as writers? What is it that we're doing next? And each time that I sort of had that question, I had the sounding board that was Tracy. You know, each time when we're going through this life as artists, it can sometimes, can I say, it could be very, very difficult, you know, as we're trying to get our first manuscripts out into the world, as we're trying to get a job, as we are trying to figure out what is the next phase of our lives as artists. I feel that every time I had that, that, that questioning, I mean, really, really deep questioning, like, is my, is my work worthy enough to be out in the world? I think of Tracy because every time I had that question, she always came back to me like, I will be your audience, I am your audience. And just thinking about this very powerful, I mean, if you know Tracy, she's like a very powerful audience of one. And just knowing that, and knowing that she was also like, she, I thought the exact same thing when I thought of Tracy coming here, is that she was into anything, anything that I wanted to put on the table, whether it was karaoke, it was like, let's just write poems in front of each other. You ask Tracy to wrestle, she'll wrestle <laughs> with you. You ask her to act something out on the spot, she'll do that. She did that at her wedding. She just was game for anything, and I think that kind of very adventurous spirit and that sense of, yes, I'm pushing you forward through every phase of your writing career, no matter what you think of yourself, I think more of you. Um, I think that's what it kind of reminds me of, that sense of support at that time. I remember being in other writing communities where that wasn't the case, and I was so <laughs> shocked. I thought everybody did that for each other. Um, I want to ask you a question um, about geography. Um, in 1999, you spent a month at Fundación Valparaíso, the residency in Spain. 
and I was so inspired by the way you came back from that time, so ecstatic, so full of creative energy and life force that I ended up following you there like four years later. Um, but I wanted to ask about that sense of possibility that you discovered there. We were just, you know, a couple years out of graduate school. You were encountering artists of other genres in other countries. Um, how did that give you, I, I want to say, did it solidify your sense of who you were or did it change you? But first, I want to read an excerpt from one of your poems that kind of takes us to Spain. It's called Eleven, America and Spain, and I thought maybe it was a nice way of allowing us to all be in one version of that place together. Is that okay? You stared at a girl outside of the bullring in Spain, her little fits, outbursts, so much like yourself. The girl's dress was ruffled pink hysteria. Gliding across the ground, she was puddle-stained, goddess, half-grown, floral, Baby senorita, you thought to yourself. Gold rings weighed down her fingers. Perfumed, she was led into the arena by her father, king of the gypsies, with the face of a ruined cave, a cane in his other hand, a head of a wolf at its tip. Thanks for reminding me of that time. Uh, going to uh, Fundacion Valparaiso was the first time uh, I felt that my poetry took me somewhere, like physically took, you know like how you're sitting in your, in your apartment or in your room, in your private spaces and you're thinking, number one, where, where will my poetry go after I write this? Where, where will it deliver me? Will it ever reach anybody, ever, outside of like this little sphere of like my little, my little page? And I think that that was, uh, in Spain, was the first time that I felt like I wrote something and I mailed it out into the world, I sent it off, and then somebody responded to me and said, come, come to Spain. You know, we'll welcome you here. And um, for any of you who've been at a writer's residency, they take very good care of you. They even did my laundry. They did my laundry, they cooked for me, and they said, here's a desk overlooking the mountains here make your work. And so I remember when I was traveling there, I took a plane, I got off, I didn't know what I was doing or where I was going, but then a taxi picked me up and I was winding up this mountain. And for the first time I thought, my poetry brought me to this place, this very magical place. And I wound up, up and up and up this hill until we got to the top. And then they took me to the highest room that there was. I was always the type of person that had like very bad like room karma. Like for college, it was giving me like the worst room ever. But this time, it was like they gave me the most beautiful room, like so that I could see all of Spain. And I could not believe it. And I felt like that was the beginning for me of something that shifted inside of me. That like yes, I can do this. You know, I can do this. I can write poems and I can go places, and I could share my work with people, and I can alter like my inner landscape too. And so we could have this relationship with each other. If you've never been to this residency before, it's a very interesting place where you are, all, you are in the mountains, but then you are also in the desert, and you're also close to the beach as well. And so all of these things together, I think, really transformed me it made me feel that, that magic, that all types of things could happen. That if you were committed enough to your craft, if you were committed enough to your artwork, that truly anything was possible. And that was like my very first taste of it. So I had a, I had a question for Tracy too, in terms of geography. Tracy's been everywhere. I mean, everywhere. I mean, everything, every time I look back at some of our cars, <laughs> Island, like she's been around, you know. So every time I get a, a letter from her, she's coming from someplace different. So I guess I just wanted to know what place have you traveled to uh, that really altered you the most internally, either creatively or in terms of love? Like what I mean, they went hand in hand. Um, but what altered you 
the most. I'm glad you mentioned love because now I have a very easy answer. Um, I when during that same time when you were probably around the time when you were in Spain, I was kind of dealing with what felt like this awful writer's block, and um, I felt like I I. I wanted to feel like that really wonderful belief in something that, that transcended language was um, was something that other the other writers that I was spending time with believed in too. And I really only felt like you felt that way. And um, I felt saddened. And I also felt like um, the poems I was writing were blocked by something. And so I kind of just stopped writing. It felt like a maybe eight or nine months worth of no poems. And one of the things that helped me was the fact that you would become so interested in photography. And then I ended up taking a photo class, photography class, and learning how to use the visual elements of narrative to feel like I was learning something about language and possibility. But at that same time, I also went to Mexico for the first time. And I would say Mexico, um, even though my relationship with that place has really changed, at that time, I feel like it really saved me as a person. To go, I, I went on a vacation with my sister and another friend that was just beachy, and there was a hurricane that met us there and drove us from the beach inland. So we had to go into um, a city called Merida, and we ended up meeting just a group of young people that were even more alive and driven by crazy possibility than I thought, you know, that was possible. And um, I was so impressed by the sense of uh, a, a world or at least a city where people were not jaded. I felt like jadedness characterized that moment and, and like so many of the, the people that I was in community with. And um, so inspired by the ways that something that wasn't perfect, like a city, a colonial city that, that had messed up infrastructure in some ways, was also so glistening and beautiful, probably in part because of what was broken. And um, I just wanted to remake myself in that place, and I wanted to forget about who I had been, forget about whatever expectations were connected to that person and start over from scratch. And learning Spanish was a, a real way of doing that, you know, I have to let go of the language that I feel at home in and find a new version of myself in this other language. Um, and that lasted for a long time, that lasted probably for about six years. Um, and I think it emboldened me to finish those poems that were going to make up my first book. And what helped me to finish them was not finding language for the me that I was aware of, but realizing that there were all these other stories and voices that I was so enamored of and so eager to learn from that I could bring into the work in place of me. And, and there, there's like a core of poems that are kind of persona poems or at the very least poems of me looking at, at these strangers with a sense of curiosity and this wish to be taught by their experience um, that I think allowed my first book to happen. It allowed me to say, all these poems that I've started and I'm waiting to finish, I now know what I can put into them to help me get there. And it's these, this other, not necessarily the other language, but the other sense of, of purpose and possibility that that language awakened me to. Um, I want to ask you a big question, Tina. This is a spirituality question. I, I don't know if I like that word. Yeah. Um, but I, I want to think that as writers, we are, you know, we're tapping into something that's not the ordinary that we live in. And it's either just another pitch of language, or I think that it's the unconscious mind that is in touch with more than what we can see, and that remembers maybe more than what we have lived in this life. Um, but then there are times when I personally, I don't know if you feel this way, think it's also in touch with other things, other voices, that if we're listening and open in the right ways, we can, we can be guided by, or, or at the very least, um, we can touch. So I want to read another little excerpt from 
uh, from your first book, uh, Half Lit Houses, there's a poem called The Unpainted Mouth. And I hear something that speaks to the spiritual realm in these lines. I'll also tell you that I was embarrassed to read these lines today and think, oh my god, I also hear that I've stolen from this poem. <laughs> like, you either taught me something about how to see the world or I've stolen. Um, the birds are perfect in the way they are constant. Song in the morning, another sound responding. I am guilty of folding the world into a fan, the shape of which collapses and then opens with its wide opulence, forcing the wind to take everything away with it. What engine of what bright animal drives me forward? And then there are lines in your, your most recent book of Gods and Strangers, in which you speak of, quote, a slip of paper from God wedged under your door. Some say it was a love letter penned in the middle of the night when he couldn't sleep. And in that same book, you also have a poem called Immortal Tether, um, in which you describe something earthbound and human that steadies the speaker and keeps her anchored to the world. And what I want to ask is, what informs your sense of that other realm? Um, what do you believe in as a poet? I hope, I hope I can address the audience by saying when I first met Tracy, and when we were very young, she was so young, she, we were both so young, um, we had both suffered tremendous losses. Um, part of that, I think, brought us together because she had as she was entering uh, to, to get her degree at, at Columbia, she had not so long ago lost her mother, and I had lost my father when I was uh, two years old, and that was a loss that sort of followed me my entire life. And I realized when I had sort of prepared this question for Tracy too, all of her books kind of travel through and question this sense of, of loss. Was it, what, it, what does it mean to lose somebody? very close to you, and then also, number one, I think, like, and I swear I'm going to get back to my work, but I wanted to talk about hers to begin with, because I, I noticed this about her work, is all of them are questioning this, and they ask, sort of, where where does, where do you go? You know, it's sort of, that's the obvious question, especially when you lose a parental figure, somebody so close to you, where do you go? Where, where are you now? You know, where have you gone to? And then, ultimately, where do, where do we go after all of this? Because as we are aging, and I don't know, maybe I have 40 years left on this earth, if I'm lucky. You know, like the idea of like that I'm not going to be here anymore. I don't, I don't have so much self-importance that I think I'm that important that I need to be here. But there's still this sort of overarching question. You know, what happens to us? You know, can we deal with the sense of like this loss that we're not going to be here anymore? And I think that those are the types of questions because we both experience this loss, this mammoth, earth-shattering loss. You know, what is a greater loss than losing a parent? Maybe perhaps losing a child. But um, I think that because of that, uh, throughout the first book, throughout a lot of our creative work that I've observed that both Tracy and I have made, it's this very all-consuming question. What is spirit? What is the spirit self? How am I anchored to this world? And, um, and I noticed that in our books, we're never actually trying to answer any questions because we don't know. So I can come up with as many guesses as I can, I can explore, but ultimately we don't know what happens to us after we pass from this particular world. But I noticed that what Tracy does so beautifully is that she's really able to explore that question from the first through the third books, and then I don't know if you've met, read her memoir, but through her memoir she explores it so beautifully, this sense of the mother, you know, where have you gone? Where are you now? If I have a question about, you know, with her first book, if I have a question about this recipe, I really want to know how it's made, or even just we had this conversation on the way over here. She said, I wanted to ask my mom, you know, like, how did we all sit together as a family? Like, did we sit together as a family? How do you make dinner and get it all on the table? And how do you do that as a mother? And I realized that that's like a great loss. We don't have that person to ask that 
question. Oftentimes, if I see myself or I hear myself saying something or doing something, I think, like, is that the way that my dad would have said that? Like, would he have said it that way? And would he, would he have, have uttered it that way? So I oftentimes tell my students that um, there, is, there is presence in absence. There is presence in absence. And so I think that that absence has fueled uh, both of our bodies of work. Um, so in all the lines that you hear um, that Tracy just read, I could read like a majority of Tracy's work back to her that speaks the sense of that we don't know, but through each of our lines and through each of our poems, we are questioning, you know, where do we go? What happens to us? What is spirit? What is self? How am I anchored here? What is my connection to you right now? And the only things that I have any kind of answer to, and which I think as a poet, I think as a poet, we should never seek an answer. I realize this as I get older and older, as I do not seek answers, I just seek to uh, explore an idea. If I can explore it to the, to the fullest that I think that I can explore, then I feel like at least I've done my job. But I don't want easy answers anymore. I don't even want difficult answers anymore because I don't think that I actually know anymore. And I think that with aging, in which we're trying to, we're discovering, we're trying to discuss whether or not we feel comfortable with aging or not, like kind of do, kind of don't a lot. Um, but with the aging, the beautiful part is, is that once you move further and further away from that sense of youth or vanity, that sense of like, I've got to keep myself together, I've got to wear my high heels, or whatever it may be, the, the, the further that we move into that sense of like, wherever it is that we're going, that sense of the unknown, is kind of like a, a release. And I think that part makes the work much stronger, don't you think? I would like to think so. Um, I don't know, I felt like I had the same sort of questions for you, is like, because you've explored this realm so much in your work, like where do you, have you ever thought to yourself, where do I go? Where, where am I going like after this existence? Oh God, I think about it all the time. I had a moment yesterday at the commencement where I saw all of the um, people from the medical school getting their uh, degrees. And I said, oh, in my next life, maybe I'm ready to be a doctor. <laughs> I want to take the Hippocratic oath. And then sometimes lately, living outside of the city, I really do feel the companionability of trees and plants. Like, I feel that there's a, um, maybe they're the majority where I live now. <laughs> and so I can hear and sense something that feels like community on that end. And um, it's very... Um, humbling, and I feel like in my next life, maybe before I become a doctor, <laughs> I'll be a tree somewhere. I, I think I'm consoled by the notion of, of um, reincarnation because I mean, both my parents are gone, and because I have these kids, and I see them. I see my parents and the kids all the time, and I want to believe it's real, you know. And I also want to believe that there is something that um, might be possible after this, this run. I don't know if you feel this way or if other people in the audience feel this way, but I, I did a talk at a high school recently and I felt so guilty because a child asked me, now that you have kids, what has changed? And I said, oh gosh, once you guys have kids, you're gonna know it, you're gonna really believe and understand that you will die. <laughs> like once you once you <laughs> once you reproduce, mortality becomes real. And then I thought, what am I doing? Is it children? Why did I just do But it's really true. I know I'm in a rush now. I've got to like somehow stay alive long enough to get to you know the milestones for these young people that are more important than anything else now. And I also know that I have to have a my plan B. <laughs> like, what am I going to do after, you know, this this thing is over, which is probably silly. Um, but maybe maybe this, you know, strong sense of belief that there is something beyond this has to do mostly with my upbringing, which was very faithful. But I can't help but think it also has to do with the sense of um, believing in the word and language as something that is, okay, you know how you talk about a poem in a workshop. You know you do it. You say, your poem has a plan, 
and you are getting in the way of your poem's plan. <laughs> and your poem is trying to tell you this, you see what the poem says here, and you keep doing this, getting in the poem's, you know, like messing that up. We know that during the process of being invested in a poem, we believe it is alive and it is independent of us. We know this. So that means that on some level, we as poets believe that language is a living force. And I really believe that that commitment changes the way that you are when you look up from the page. If you believe that language is world creating, then you believe that there are these other worlds that we know a little bit about. Um, I love that idea. I'm ready to just I'm ready to just be the crazy lady who goes there. Um, I'm ready to also make huge statements like there is poetry that is submissive to this idea that language is alive and that there is a sense of clarity that it can offer us and then there's poetry that doesn't believe that and that thinks all language can do is be a mouthpiece for what we think we know, what we think we're funny at, what we think we're good at, and it, it's about nailing and narrowing things down. And I think that's like a deadening thing. It's the opposite of the life force. Um, and so I'm really interested in finding evidence for this other theory that I think is happier, that the poet, that language can be generative, and that we can be healed and changed by it. Um, I don't know that I felt that way. I don't know that I felt um, conscious of feeling that way when I was younger as a writer. But more and more, maybe it's because I now see my death just over the horizon, or um, that's a joke, but um, more and more I feel like I, I, I want to ask language to save me, you know? And our culture should be asking those kinds of questions too, I think. Um, maybe I'll ask you about love. Um, so your first book is really about being a daughter and surviving and coming of age. And your second book, I think, is thinking about civilization. And it's thinking, you know, to quote Brenda Shaughnessy, love as a civilization. Thinking about love as, as this world that we can find ourselves um, alive and um, nourished by and also damaged by even the most beautiful um, kind of relationship changes us. And the poems that I've, I've heard you read that are really recent are thinking about motherhood, you know, and that is a really different vocabulary for love. But I feel like what I, I hear there is a version of Tina that's inexhaustible and selfless. And um, you say, I shall be for you the man ascending the cliff until the steed I ride throws me into the pasture of the everlasting. I shall be a mother whose bright milk runs with fever and anguished love, with a head in my hands, if the head shall equal justice. I shall be a father too, glorious and eternal. If this is blasphemy, let me love the world into fantastic horses, ride them to a distant country where I drown in brocade, fragrant vine. This is a version of you that's so emboldened by the love of motherhood. Um, where is that leading you as a poet? What are you asking of it? Well, she was reading some unpublished stuff where I was, uh, you know, I was, I was, I was very afraid about writing these uh, particular poems. That, that, that poem that she just read uh, focused on the work of Kehinde Wiley. And I don't know, do you know his yeah. work? And so I was just uh, focusing on these artists whose work I love so much, and I was looking at how powerful his work was, and just. I think I sent that work to Tracy because I wanted to ask her, do I have a right to write of and speak to and through these characters that I felt like needed a different kind of voice? And that's the beauty of, I think, the, the interaction between different works of art is that when you're walking through, you're not passive. You know, when you're, when you're looking at a piece of art or you're experiencing dance or theater, 
you're not passive. Your mind is always at work as you're having fantasies of your own and interacting with it. So as I was looking at Kahinde Wiley's work as well as the work of artists like Carol Walker, I was thinking, you know, I have a life too, and my life speaks to this, and my life wants to speak through these characters, and so Tracy's my sounding board for everything, and whenever I'm feeling afraid, I write to her and I say, look, I've written these poems. This is like the life in letters. I've written these poems. What do I do? Is it okay? Is it okay for me to send it out into the world? And she always writes, yes, yes. Yes, send it out to the world, it's totally okay. And I feel like that's the kind of like supportive relationship that we have. If there is ever a more empowering uh, feeling, it is that of uh, giving life to something else. Um, and so we could say that that is giving life in the form of poems, but then there's the actual physicality of giving life to another human being. Um, when I when I became mother for the first time, I was 40 years old. I didn't think that I was going to be a mother. Uh, I was kind of at the I was kind of at the cusp of pretty much giving up. You know, I had said I was like sending out messages to the universe, and I said, universe, I think this is my last year. Universe, <laughs> I think my life really has to change this year. You know. I was like, I think it's been the same for a really long time. This is like thus the years from 2000, 2008, nothing was changing. And everything felt very similar from the year before. And so I, I put out this message to the universe, like, I just don't want anything to be the same this year. And just something heard me and snapped into place. And all of a sudden it's like, whoops, I was pregnant. And then <laughs> my entire life, just the life force, completely changed and I found myself very late in my life like with child and then after that I felt very protective of something else other than myself so you know when Tracy reads that it's like there's a lot of rage in me you know there's a lot of rage in me in terms of being a mom because I have I have a child who's Asian American African American and I see him and I don't want him to be harmed ever and if somebody comes in the, in the way of that, I feel like I will do everything. I'll just like rip everything apart. You know, the world will just fall apart because I need to protect this child and this like ferocity of my emotions and the passion of my emotions just spills onto the page because just today, my husband was like, wait a minute, there was this guy and he was walking around and he just got shot. You know, they said he was being aggressive and he just got shot, he lost his life. He goes, in other countries, he's like, there are other ways of dealing with individuals who they, other people feel like they are being aggressive. They don't just get shot dead. He goes, it just doesn't happen. He goes, there are other methods within our society of dealing with this. He goes, it's got to stop. So when I think of my son, you know, and he's like the subject of pretty much all of my poems now, my new manuscript, it's like, I think of him. And there's something about the power of when you think of the life of somebody else, especially when you gave life to them, it creates a kind of energy. It's like, you're not even writing anymore. You're just emoting. You know, you're just like, it comes out as words because that's like my chosen craft. It's what I know how to do because I'm not a great dancer. I don't have long limbs. I don't know how to act. I'm really, really, as Tracy knows, doesn't know how to sing. I don't know how to sing. You know, I don't have those, that capability. So when I feel that kind of passion, it kind of comes out in words. It just kind of spills forth. And so everything I think about as a mother, it's like that power of what is it like? Oh my goodness. Whoever is in the audience, if you've ever given life to some, something else, it's like there's really nothing, there's really nothing like it. I could not have envisioned this kind of power coming over me. You know, I was so scared. Tracy and I, what we would do like right before the children were born because we were pregnant at the same time, we would do this thing where we would like watch videos of like babies being born. And we're like, oh my goodness. That's what's gonna happen. I became I was overwhelmed with fear. But then as the weeks came up and I knew that this child was gonna come for me, it's like I felt this power, this power, this power. And then like the day that the child came, I was like, oh, it's gonna be good. It's gonna be really, really good. And he took a long time and he wasn't coming into this earth. And I was like, you take your time, baby. 
you take your time. And then like, when he came, it was like, oh, you know, now I understand. I understand, you know, parts of the universe now that I had no access to before, and all of that speed back to poetry, all of that, I think, is art, you know? Don't you, did you feel the same? I don't, I agree with that. <laughs> yeah. I also feel like there's, you know, part of the wish of, of, of making art has to be, and I, I think it becomes more, um, it's more, not even just more realized, but more um, ravenous when you realize something like a child. But I feel like the wish is to have that sense of commitment and investment in the world, in some part of the world, even you know when you're 22 and you're kind of like trying to make a poem happen. And you, I think it, it, it's a, a desire that is born from this notion that I want to be as committed, and I want to be as um, devoted to something else, something outside of myself. Um, I know that the poem can be this bridge, almost, between the young poet and some sort of a, a far-flung other that needs something, just the same way that a, a baby needs something. And it doesn't need it from you, but it needs, it needs in the way that if we can recognize that, we can learn something about ourselves too, and we can learn something about um, maybe how our lives as humans can be fuller and more compassionate or something like that. Um, but I guess that's a way of saying that, you know, there, there are these capacities that are open to all of us, even if we're not gonna give birth to someone, there's this sense of, um, commitment to others that can and should be fervent like that. Um, but our lives, you know, are, are shaped differently. But you talk about the, the universe. Maybe now is a good time to share one of our last secrets. <laughs> so every time we have the chance, which tends to be maybe a couple times a year, um, Tina and I and other friends who are, are and are not writers um, have this kind of wish-making ritual. Um, and I thought it might be interesting, I don't know, or, or revealing to share a little bit of that. And I, I feel like the vocabulary in these wishes, um, which are really about our lives as humans, as women, as people, s speaks to some of the very same urges that um, are behind the desire to make art. So one of the last times that we did this with another group of people, we printed out this little instruction list for people who had never done this. And I don't know, a part of my motivation was, we're not crazy. <laughs> Where we actually like, this could be just a good exercise, depending on how you want to take it. Um, so here are some questions. And we said, as if you have the power of the universe at your disposal, write down your first reaction to the following questions. Be bold, write without second guessing yourself. I think a poet could do this every season and get something different out of it. Who and what am I? Why am I? For what larger purpose am I an agent? What, for my own sake and the sake of that larger purpose, do I hope to complete during my lifetime? What do I want to make sure will last beyond my lifetime? Now you can't have those questions in your head every time you write a poem or you will not get anywhere. If you're thinking about lifetimes and, and posterity, you won't get anywhere. But once or twice a year, I think it's good to look up and say, what is this little bitty piece of the puzzle that I am trying to fit into? And then the next step, now, if what you've written were to be called your ideal self, which traits and characteristics present in your real life self are compatible with that ideal version? So there's a way that you could use this to say, okay, what am I doing that's getting in the way of you know, this real sense of myself? As an artist, there's a way that you could say, what am I doing that might um, bring me closer to some of my goals? You know, and, and what might I, become more willing to let go of. In fact, the next question is, what traits and habits would you need to eliminate from your real life self 
in order to make that ideal version possible. Um, trying to think of how this could be helpful to writers, and maybe it's, can I stop and take a look at what's, what, what's happening on the page, and, and is it in, impeding some of the questions that I hope my poems are really bringing me um, into contact with. And then I guess the next steps that we would make are, what are we grateful for? And you make a list, a long list, and then what are you ready to receive based on you know, this version of, of your ideal self? And, and our wishes are very specific. <laughs> yeah, why do you think that we do that? Well, um, I could say that Tracy and, I, so Tracy and I started these wishing ceremonies when we were very young. And I don't know where it came from exactly, but we thought that we needed some kind of ceremony because there's too much unknown in the world, you know? And there's, um, I think oftentimes, the things that we think to ourselves is what we wish and what we want are so private. You know, we'll walk, we'll walk through the world and we're thinking, oh, I wish I had this job, or I'm hopeful that maybe I'll find love, whatever it is the bigger things are in life, but oftentimes it's to ourselves. And so I think what really came about is that Tracy and I said to each other, like, we're besties, you know, we, there, there's no reason why we shouldn't utter our deepest and our most secretive uh, longings in the world, but to each other. So in the beginning, we started just kind of letting each other know. We'd write it down on a piece of paper, we'd burn it, and things like it goes somewhere in the universe. And what was really interesting is that usually, like about a year or two later, those things would like come true. So we're like, okay, let's expand our circle, okay? I said, so we got together, like, big, the, just the circle started growing, where it's like, we're gonna gather, it didn't have to be women, but we just kept inviting women. We're like, let's invite powerful women. Let's invite, like, glorious women. Let's invite beautiful women to this thing. And so we kept inviting more and more women, and the circle kept growing until I was just about to have my baby. I said, I don't need any more celebrations because you guys have celebrated me. And they said, no, let's have one. So I think it might have been 15 or 16 women. We all got together and we did this wishing ceremony. And it's a really powerful thing to be able to ponder some of the questions that Tracy is deep. It's like, who am I? What am I? What am I placed in this world, in this world to do? What is my role? And if I was given the power to wish for something that I could do as a vessel, like, what, what would that be? You know, and I think it's a very useful thing in life that even if you don't think that big, huge thing is gonna happen, to say that to a room full of people, and what was really interesting about this is that sometimes the women in the room wouldn't know each other at all. And sometimes they did, but it, it, it makes you very vulnerable to sit there and say, well, these are the things that are sort of happening in my life. This is what I think is in my personality that keeps me away from my biggest dreams. And listen, I'm gonna tell you what I really, really want in this world. And what was really powerful about that session that we had together is like people were wishing for some big stuff. I mean, people were like, look, I'm trying to get pregnant, I can't get pregnant, um, I don't know what to do, I'm looking for love. I, in the next year, I actually want to get married, I wanna have a baby, and I wanna have a book. I mean, they were wishing for really big things where somebody was like, I'm suffering from an illness, I've been suffering my whole life from this illness. I don't want this illness anymore. And so what was really interesting about that session is that everybody got what they wanted. You know, and I don't know if that's just to say that it was the power of so many people listening to your wishes and they get to put it out into the universe like, okay, this is what you want. Even though I don't know you, I know you want this. And so I'm gonna walk through the world, not just thinking about myself and what I want, but I'm thinking about you and I'm thinking about what you want today, and I'm putting it out there, and I'm putting it out there, and I'm putting it out there, and what was really interesting is that all these people's, all of our wishes started coming true, and some of them were big, like Pulitzer Prize big, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> 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 no, I mean, some of them were very, very big, meaning like we wanted like really, really interesting things in life, you know, like simple things, like I want a home, you know, I just got my first house, like this year, just now, it took me like six years of wishing for it, right, Nicole, right? I mean, like, you wish and you wish and you utter it to the universe, and then, you know, something, some, somebody somewhere is going to hear you, and there's going to be some level of response, and I think that that's what it was like, you know, sitting in the midst of, 
all these people to say like, hey, you know, there's some things that I want to give. You know, there's some things that I'm really grateful for. And there's some things I still think that while I have time left on this earth, I'd really like to do. You know, and I hope that somebody gives me the permission and the power and the agency and the space and the location to do all these things that I'd like to do. And I think that's what those wishing ceremonies did for us. We started sharing them with people like Camilla. And we started sharing them with other people to say, do this thing every once in a while. Light some candles, invite people over. It doesn't matter if it's a man or woman. It doesn't matter. Like Invite each other over and tell each other, admit to each other what you need in this world and what you want to do. So that didn't answer your question at all. You did a really nice job of bringing it back to the sense of community, and maybe that is even more important than what the specific, you know, like act of things that you want for yourself signifies, right? And um, writing can be such a solitary act, and if you're focusing on the end game for yourself, it can be ugly, you know. But the way that, that you describe taking in and taking seriously somebody else's needs and wishes on a you know, lifestyle level, um, reminds me of the way that we supported each other as classmates and the way that we support each other as readers and saying this is a, a voice that is asking for um, material and for clarity and for growth and for um, something to, to hear and speak back to it. And I want to help that. I want to believe in that. And if you can take your energy that you're often in your little room directing right back at yourself and say, I'm, all right, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this out here for somebody who I believe in, I feel like it, it's wholly good, you know? And I, I feel like it, um, you know, on the very simple level, it's a kind of generosity that means that you're, you're committing to the larger work of the word and how can that not help you as, a, as an individual as well? Maybe we should, does anybody have, is there anything we have not already said? Like, do you have any questions or? Yeah, I've been a fan of Tracy's work since my undergrad. Um, a friend of mine, no, a professor of mine gave me your book and I've been in love with your work ever since. And I'm just now getting familiar with Tina's work. And I just want to say thank you for bringing up the universe because I always say the universe does hear you when, it's, when you speak to it. Um, yeah, so I just graduated and got my master's. And how do you deal with post-graduate anxiety? Because I'm kind of in this weird space where I know what, my, what I want my life to be, but I don't know just yet. I'm kind of floating in the ether. So I guess when you both graduated and got your master's, who was there for you or what did you do to do the next big step, whatever that was or looked like for you? Well, we were, you know, teachers are so wonderful. Um, and when you have access to them on a regular basis, it's illuminating and it can save you time and it can console you and then you find yourself outside of a program and your teachers are focusing on their current students and, and that's where your classmates and peers become really crucial, I think. And so I remember those years after finishing school and, and wanting, to sit, wanting to be inspired, not just wanting to finish or write my own poems, but wanting to be inspired. And I remember saying, Tina, send me your manuscript, send me what you're working on. I need to be inspired. I want to read you and, and think about what it makes me want to say. Um, and that was some of the most exciting, like in retrospect, and freeing kind of writing that I've ever done. Also because you're just writing. You're not, there's no end game where you know what you want the end game to be, but nobody else is saying, where's this manuscript? And so there's a sense I can try and do really crazy things and practice and fail and keep going and, and living and making mistakes that are probably ultimately going to make me a bigger person. And that person maybe will know how to fix this poem that I don't know how to fix right now. Um, and then the other thing that I keep thinking now, all the times that I thought I was making the final decision about my life, okay, I'm gonna go into this, this line of work or I'm moving to this place, it was just one of many decisions, many of which were contradictory. And um, maybe there's something um, exciting about not even necessarily being, to see, being able to see that. You know, when you're when you're fresh out of school and thinking that everything is riding on every choice you make, maybe that 
feeling that the stakes are that high um, makes you feel like what you're saying, something's right, it's important. Um, I think that, you know, in the beginning you are expressing this deep admiration for Tracy's work, which I feel too, but I can say that, um, see, so you're seeing sort of the end result of some of the many, many years that, for example, Tracy has worked on her work. If you could have witnessed us in the beginning in this exact same phase of when we first graduated, just reading that first letter from Tracy where she's like, what job do you have? I don't know, what kind of job do I have? What am I doing? I mean, that was going on for a very long time. I mean, after we had gone to California, we came back to New York, we were temping. I mean, we were just talking about our temping life. I mean, we were just taking on any kind of odd job to kind of just get the bills paid and she was telling me like she was just after this going to this beautiful commencement at uh, at Columbia because Tracy's so uh, she's so humble I think she got an honorary degree at Columbia just a day a few days ago and um, but at that time she was saying as she was staying at this hotel she was recounting to her husband I remember when I was wandering around I was thinking can I afford this slice of pizza? <laughs> you know, and that's like really the stage that we were at. You know, even she had this beautiful poem that was on, that was on the, that was on the wall in, um, in the subway stations, which is called The Good Life. And, you know, it was about this idea, but it's not so far from where we used to be. Like, I remember when she, even when she was married, she was telling me like, I don't know, we're making soup because that's like the least expensive thing right now. And it's like filling us up. You know, this is like at the moments where we're like making our first book. So it's like sometimes we only see the tail end of, of what it is that we, we admire, but we don't get to see the very beginning parts when people are truly going through a lot. And that's what I was able to witness about Tracy's life and vice versa. All the struggle it took to actually get to even the first book. I mean, there were moments where the, each of us came to each other. I remember so vividly. I just, I mean, after a lot of struggle, I just, and I don't even know if she remembers this, I just got my book accepted by a publisher, and I remember us walking around the East Village, and she was like, I don't know, you know, I don't know, is this, is this manuscript of mine going to be accepted? And I turned to her and I said, it absolutely will, it will be accepted, you have to keep pushing it out to the world, and maybe just a few months later, it won the Cave Canem Prize, you know, so it's like, but if she gave up, you know, she had decided, like, look, I'm a little tired. I'm just going to put that pen down for a little while, not send my work out into the world. It would have been a totally different trajectory, how grateful I am. And a lot of that is friendship, you know. When I first entered into Columbia, one of the greatest things that happened is that I met her and I met her uh, a few other classmates. And the good thing about that is, like, you're entering, I always tell, talk to people about the sense of a tribal situation, you know, like, we, we're, we're, we're all tribal people, we walk into a situation, we need others, you know, in an artistic situation, we need people, even if it's a tribe of one, we need one person, if you have one person that you can bounce your ideas off, if you have one person to encourage you, if you have one person to say, hey, can I show you my manuscript, that's, that's all you need, you know, and, and when I got to California, I had nobody you know, Tracy was in a stagner, I had my boyfriend, I didn't have any kind of writing community, but luckily just two other people and I found each other and we started meeting at each other's homes. Every other week we had some wine, we had some food, and we made our work. And we made sure to be beholden to each other, like look, let's keep, let's keep examining each other's work until we get our books published. And everybody published their books at different times. You know, I published my book, and then the next person published their book four years later, and the next person took 12 years or more, maybe 15 years, to publish his first book, and he got it out into the world. Which is to say, there's no competition. Everybody gets it out at a different time, whenever it's ready, however long it takes to kind of brew and cook. That's how long it takes, you know? But I think that just seeking that, just like a small, teeny, tiny community is so helpful to getting the work out into the world. Yeah, 
I remember when I got to Columbia thinking, I already have my friends. These people are just going to be my late life friends. Um, I had, a, you know, my college roommate was my bosom friend, and um, that bond was very different. And I guess the language of poetry was something that it was really exciting to be able to speak with somebody else, right? Um, at first, I felt like I'm two different people. You know, like I'm the person that they, my real friends know me as, and then I'm the person that these kids, these kids at school know me as, you know? And then, it's funny now to think about, you know, the years, I've known, we've known each other 20 some years, and, um, the development that has happened in this stage of life and the like, choices we've made, or maybe what I like to think of as the things that we've chosen to give our lives to, um, they've deepened that. Um, so now sometimes I feel a little bit of grief for the other friendships that are gone or that are you know, weighted differently. Um, there are lots of moments in a life when things change. I think that um, we've spoken so much about how children invigorates your sense of purpose as an individual, but it changes everything, too. We see each other so much less frequently, and I feel like we hear ourselves so much less, <laughs> you know? Like, I, the, the, the race to fulfill the needs of these people that are utterly important means that I don't have this ample, spacious silence that I, I used to live in. We were just talking about this miraculously. We saw each other two days ago. And we were talking about how when we were, before we were parents, the day was this vast plane. And you know, like you, you could wake up when you wanted to and decide if you were gonna use it or not. Um, and now it, it's very different. There are these things that are being, you're, you're devoted to people and, and habits and routines. And then there are these little slivers of time when you can go to this other place where time goes away and you can touch, touch base with this other value system that you have. Um, but it's, it's been redistributed, I guess, the, the energy and the ability to focus, at least for me right now. It, I'm sharing that focus with a lot of my, my three children, and work, and other, other kinds of service, I think. But I value that. I think that um, makes me realize how valuable every moment is and how much when I do have those little slivers of time, I want to just sit down and get to work and not worry about being anxious about it anymore. Um, first, thank you so much for being here and answering the questions and just sharing your story with everyone. My first question is to Tina. One being the Brooklyn poet, uh, being the Brooklyn poet laureate. In what ways have you allowed Brooklyn to inhabit your work and inhabit you, and speak back to it? How has it affected your writing? How has it affected your perception of the world and just the borough alone? And what things in your writing in the future do you wish to do for Brooklyn and Brooklyn do for you? And um, Tracy, um, congratulations again. I congratulations on being the director of the Creative Writing Program at Princeton. Um, I didn't say it before, I didn't know you, but no, I can't say it. <laughs> um, as a writer of color, as a woman, as a woman who, of color who is a writer, what has that position done for you? To, for your writing, personally, what avenues are you hoping to explore and open for other writers and other people? What have you experienced so far that has affected you negatively, if you can speak about it? And what has affected you positively? And what's like, what's the future goals? Like, how are we gonna like dismantle this white gaze? And how are we gonna influence the writing to be more positive towards writers of colors and their experiences? So necessarily, it doesn't matter the color you're coming from, the experience you're coming from, it's what writing you come from. How honest are you being on the page? That's a lot of good questions. That's a lot of good questions. 
Um, so I think that your first question had to do with uh, being the Brooklyn Poet Laureate and, and how I feel like just I think I think both your questions to both of us are sort of similar is that how do our positions how are we impacted by our position and how do we wish to impact others with our position so I feel like they're similar in that degree um, so I think that one of the things that I realized that I did, so it's been sort of multi-layered, where the first year where I was the Broken Poet Laureate, I was just completely overwhelmed, um, not even really knowing yet what my role was supposed to be. Because the thing with the, with the Poet Laureate is that there's no actual definition of what it is that you're supposed to do. And it's kind of like being a poet, it's like, I thought that position was like so already like without definition, and now this one is also without definition. <laughs> really? So um, I kind of for the first year was just like feeling around, just figuring out what I was supposed to do. So I would have say for the first three years, I was just visiting a lot of institutions and a lot of schools and a lot of communities. Basically, any community, any writing community that invited me to be a part of their uh, a part of their circle, I went. So I was, I was busy because there's a, I didn't realize that there's a lot of writing communities in Brooklyn. There's so many different pockets within a very sort of small sphere. So what I did was I took time out almost like every weekend, every few days, I would go and visit a northern organization and like completely floored by what it is that they did. So there are organizations that are completely female based, that do, they're, they're people that are young, that are raising money for their writers themselves, and they're raising money for writers in other countries. There are writing communities in which they're training teachers to go into uh, at-risk schools to train other teachers at those schools in terms of poetry. I mean, there's, there's just so many communities. So for a long time, I think that my role was a witness. You know, it had to really take a long time for me to figure that out. I'm like, what am I doing here? What do they want me to do here? You know, so I listened for a very long time. I would offer my own work, but I felt like the most important work was to listen to all, mostly youth. You know, a lot of youth, like all around Brooklyn, had things to say. So I would go to slams, and then the greatest thing was like uh, probably going up to the, there was a slam at the Apollo Theater that they have every single year. And I, I you know, okay, so I'm used to small audiences, you know, because like poets on the page is like, we're lucky. If like there's 50 people who are like, oh, we're so appreciative. But when I went up to the Apollo Theater, I was completely floored. I mean, there were hundreds and thousands of people. They were dancing in the aisles. They were, they were so emotive in terms of like all of their energy. There was so much audience energy that they were giving out to the people that were on the stage. And for me, being always a writer on the page in my own little world, like to me, that was that was awe-inspiring. I was in awe watching them. And so that's sort of like the world that I've been involved in in terms of what I've been taking in and in terms of what it is that I would like to do. You know, I've been a lot of, involved in a lot of projects. Like one of the projects was taking my own college students like to be trained as teachers to try to bring them into schools, mostly middle schools, so that they can help um, they could help other students who are really, really in need of a lot more attention in terms of their own writing. So that was like a large part of my project. Then I had garden projects, I had pop-up projects where I'm like trying to use almost like guerrilla tactics to bring poetry out into the world, surprising people at the last second, you know, with poetry to see how they react. And you know, now, honestly, I, I still am seeking to work with the Brooklyn Borough President because I was really much more in touch with Marty Markowitz, I have to be totally honest. And I want to actually try to bring more youth, you know, to the current Brooklyn Borough President, trying to make like more platforms for young people because I think that's what we need. You know, like with everything that's happening now, Tracy and I were talking about right now, at this moment in history, there's so much at stake. There's so much at stake, right? I mean, who we're gonna vote for, what's happening, and I feel like wherever I go, people need a voice. So I think like what I'm consistently working on is more platforms for people. I recognize you. I don't know where I recognize Is it from one of the slams? Where do I recognize you? Alright, that's how I that's how I recognize you. So you know all about that, right? And you know that there's more and more opportunities that we need to create for youth to be able to express themselves. And one of the things that I do want to start on Facebook is actually taking in ideas from other people as because I'm I can't be the only one coming up with ideas, right? I feel like there's a lot more people with a lot more ideas and what we can sort of work on together moving forward. It's inspiring. Um, 
sort I, I feel in some ways like there's a little overlap. Um, I'll say though, when I first took the position as director, my view was, okay, I'm supporting this faculty of ridiculously famous writers. I have to find out how to make Joyce Carol Oates comfortable, and Paul Muldoon comfortable. And then I realized as I began to understand how many needs the wonderful students at Princeton had and how engaged they were with um, politics, with uh, questions of race and history and legacy and inclusion and representation, that my job had very little to do. Like there, there's a whole division of the university that supports the faculty. That's not what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to be finding out how we can serve our students better and how our course offerings and our sense of um, community can have a greater and deeper kind of impact on the students that we have and how we can be more inviting to the students who might not even know that they're writers yet. Um, and that was really exciting and it took away the anxieties of, of the egos of others and it made me realize, okay, well we're an arts program. We are um, a faculty that's um, relatively diverse but we can do better and let's, so let's see if we can make an effort to do better. And we also have these students who are engaged in other parts of the university where they are putting themselves on the line. And they're um, making statements about what they feel and need that not everyone, even their friends, is able or willing to listen to and, and value. And so, um, one of the things I'm really proud of that we were able to do this year was to create um, these conversations around race and the arts. We could say, what are we, what are we talking about? What is it that we as makers of art need in order to feel that our work is valued and also really productive and, and can be relevant? Um, what is it that we as your teachers have forgotten that we should do or have been um, blind to in terms of your needs and wishes. And so we had a number of these conversations with students where the faculty initially just listened and took notes. The students are um, incredible and they have thought deeply and systematically about how it feels to be part of many different communities <coughs> and to be seen or ignored in different ways and they've thought about what they want their teachers to do that we haven't thought to do because we're busy with our own egos and schedules. Um, and I think that those first conversations changed a lot. You know, we've, we've got now some initiatives, I guess, that um, are allowing students to have more mentoring with faculty and also for students of color to mentor each other and reach out to <coughs> students who might feel intimidated by academic um, arts programs, but who are making art extracurricularly. So my goal is that while I'm in this position, we're gonna change the, the nature of the dialogue and the population distribution, I guess, like who, who we are as, a, as the Lewis Center for the Arts. Um, I want it to be more reflective of all the people on campus who believe art, you know, takes us back to those questions we were talking about earlier, who am I? What is important? What is lasting? What What is even justice? And how can art, or poetry, or dance contribute to this sense of what justice is or should be? Um, so I feel like that's my mission. Um, and, and the other things, if we can be doing something that's val valuable in those ways, everything else seems easy. Course scheduling, that's easy. If we can think about justice, that's, that's, that's the real goal. to do is to 
wrestle with things that are tricky and sometimes unsettling and you know that speaks to private experience but it also really speaks to my sense of the public world uh, current events and public history and so I've always felt like if I have a an itch a poem can help me get at it a little bit which means that I'm a, I think that much of my work is speaking in very direct terms to events that um, I am aware of or aware of the need to be more educated about, thinking about other geographies, thinking about the discomfort that I have as an American um, being the beneficiary of a lot of um, comfort, security, and realizing that this way of life is predicated upon destabilizing that in lots of other places. I feel very comfortable engaging with that in a poem because I think yeah. the poem is very good at stopping time, pulling us out of the easy answers that we live in, even pulling us out of the opinions that we feel very comfortable in at, say, like a dinner party, where we can say, I think this candidate is right, and everybody who disagrees is wrong. Huh. A poem that's written like that is bad. Yeah. It's a bad piece of art. Yeah. And so what a poem urges you to do is to move outside of these easy certainties and to find ways that even you, yourself, are implicated in the very things that you are speaking against, yeah. and to start from there and see where you can go. And I, I feel like Tina's work does a lot of the same thing. And yeah. just looking at your most recent book, you've got these major poems that are thinking about um, stories that have been reported really vigorously in the New York Times. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Tracy. I, I think that any good poem doesn't have the easy answers, but it also helps you engage in more conversation. So I was telling Tracy yesterday that recently I, I made some statements at the, the Penn uh, Awards, and I made some statements about um, my background, which is everything from Asian American, African American, Haitian American, Muslim, Latin American, and then because I made these statements, and because I made a statement about the current political environment that we are in, and all I referenced was the building of walls. Yeah. I referenced the building of walls, and that, uh, of course, I was very adamantly against such things, and so I, I made some mistake, statements that one would deem to be political, and then I told Tracy that recently I began to get threatening messages. Uh, from people and, that, and that's what happens too. You know, sometimes you do make strong statements and sometimes they are definitely subtle and open to lots of interpretation and sometimes you're emboldened to make statements that really there are, there are, there's like kind of one straight way of looking at it and, um, and I felt the need at that moment to really engage in that way and as a result sometimes you have to be really prepared for what comes back. At you, I think. I think because we're in this really heightened political environment, which where everything that we say and do is so important right now, because we're leading up to a very, very important vote now. That sometimes I don't feel like because I'm getting so old, I don't feel room, there's room for so much subtlety anymore. I need to kind of state my mind and be quite forward about it. But that's very different from the poem, which can engage in much more subtle ways. And the beauty of it is interpretation.
basket. Actually, Tina, do you want to select three winners? And then, Tracy, you can select three. Thank you so much. Bravo. Fabulous conversation.